Hey, welcome back, you guys, to uh, Church New Way. We are going to be covering a lot of scripture today, so you might want to grab a pen and a pad uh, just for writing them down and referencing them back uh, later. Um, we're we're going to get into a, a talk that um, I think a lot of us can relate to. Uh, but before I do it, you know, one of the things that we are as a as a society. We're very much uh, performance-driven, performance-based. You know, I, I think about you know work, right? And uh, at, once a year at work, they give a performance review, right? They want to look at everything that we've done the, the year prior and, and base our performance, um, you know, basically against each other's performance and then say, okay, you're worth this much because of your performance. So our pay, our, our, which relates to the way that we live, uh, everything down the line is affected by our performance. So our whole life revolves around this performance, right? Or how we hand that down through our families. I mean, think about it. I go to my daughter's, um, let's say, volleyball game, right? And I'm judging her performance against some of her friends' performance, and and I'm talking to her about things she could do better, right? And so uh, we're performance driven or based in, in our life in every way, shape, and form. And it, and it makes its way into everything, actually, even um, religion and relationship um, that we have with God, right? And so religion is in and of itself a performance-based thing is from its nature. It's a, if you look in, in uh, Webster's Dictionary in, under religion, uh, it's essentially a set of rules to attain something that makes us right with a higher being. So with the Bible in particular, um, we're going to take a look at religion versus relation. Religion versus relation. Something that can help us understand how to not be performance-based in our relationship with God and not turn it into a religion. Because how many of you know, reality is uh, there are no religious people that are going to make it into heaven. Just as there's no non-Christians that are going to make it into heaven. You know, that's a, that's a, a rough statement to say, but you'll see through Scripture that uh, it, it agrees with that. Let's start in Romans chapter 2. You grab your Bibles and open it up to Romans chapter 2, and we're going to hit verse 1 through 5 to begin with, okay? Now, to understand this, though, it's Paul, the apostle, writing to Jews, to the religious people of his day. This is religion 101, okay? He's talking to the religious people of the day. We might say today that uh, it's it's someone talking to a, a church, a Christian church, all right? It's, it's very similar in its nature. Therefore, he says, every one of you who judge without excuse, for when you judge another, you condemn yourself. How many people know that when you have one finger pointing out, you got three fingers pointing back at you? That's essentially what he's saying here. He's saying, man, uh, you guys judge. Oh, and by the way, how many people know that the church in and of itself, the two things that it's well known for, judgment and hypocrisy. We're going to see both of those today. And here he says, therefore, every one of you who judges, every one of you who, who fills that uh, role, is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself. Since, why? You, the judge, do the same thing. Now, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. Do you think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same? That you'll escape God's judgment? Now, he's he's laying out the, the foundation of of. The concept in which it says, you were given as Jews a law, the Ten Commandments. Now, they expanded it to 613 laws, but, but you have this law that you think you could judge others by. 
But at the same token, you break those same things. And so you're, you're condemned yourself. Now, he's going to give a better way here. He's going to allude to a different and, and better way. He says, or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Wow. Not a tell fire brimstone or a, hey, this, you better do this or you're going to hell. But instead... He says, or do you despise the riches? These are, these are wealth oriented, the riches of his kindness. Man, there, there's great wealth in the fact that there's kindness from God. There's restraint by God. There's patience in God. Not recognizing that literally God's kindness is intended to lead you to repent and come back to him. Now he says, because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment is revealed. When the one who actually gets to judge, the one who, who has the right to judge, judges, you're not going to be doing very well. That's what he's, he's laying out an argument, Paul is, that you can't become righteous by the law. The law never was intended to make someone righteous. Why? Because we don't have the ability to actually keep it. Now, <clears throat> that's written to the religious people. But what about um, the non-Christians? So they call them Gentiles in this day. And in Romans, this is just before what we read, Romans 1, 28 through 32, he writes about the Gentiles. So let's take a look at where they stand. And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a corrupt mind so that they do what is not right. Now, before we go any further, it sounds like it's God's fault there, right? But actually what he's saying is, think about it, I delivered them over to what they already wanted. Because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, because they don't want anything to do with me, I gave them over to what they wanted. That's a gentleman. That's actually not someone forcing love on someone, right? And what was the repercussion? It says here that they are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. Now he's going to describe what they are doing, what the acts of which they are doing that describe what evil, greed, and wickedness are. They're full of envy, murders, quarrels, deceit, malice. Uh, they're gossips, slanders, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to their parents. I think that one ought to be uh, brought to the forefront here because um, think about it. Uh, he just put murderers with, along with they didn't listen to their parents. We all fit that crowd, right? Untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. That's how he describes all these people. That there's there's tons of things they're doing. From the little things of not obeying my parents, to quarreling, to being uh, a murderer, or just unmerciful, unloving, untrustworthy. You ever broke a promise? You're in there. So, then goes on and says, although they know God's just sentence, that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only did them, but they even applauded others who practiced them. So these were the Gentiles of the day. Without question, we could say, you know, non-Christians fit the same bill. No, no doubt about it, right? Um, and, and the religious people and the non-Christian now fit one category. They fit the category of uh, that... Basically, by try, trying to follow any sort of rules, they're not going to be a, obtaining righteousness or right standing with God. They're going 
to reap the reward of which he said would be uh, God's wrath. So, if religious and non-religious people, non-Christians, uh, trying to follow the rules don't get the job done, then, then where are we left? What do we do? Well, I think we're going to see in Galatians 3, 23 through 29, a different way. <clears throat> a start to a different way. It's an, it's an invitation, if you will. Now, therefore... Oh, sorry. Now there, now before faith came, there were held captive. We were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. By faith. But now that faith has come. We're no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. There it is again. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, Heirs according to the promise. No. Now, think about this. He says that instead of the law, which was a guardian that kept it, it was like a tutor pointing us to the fact, that, hey, you need grace. You need something other than this law. It pointed to the fact that we needed something, and that was justified by faith in Christ. Now, I'm sure you've heard before, well, yeah, justified by faith in Christ. Uh, yeah, he, he died for my sins, you know. Um, we, we flippantly think about that, but what does it mean to be in Christ? Because we can turn that into religion really quick, and there are a lot of religions built around Jesus Christ. Another just, hey, we're going to take our, our life from doing in the flesh to doing in religion, and, and we do, 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 do. It's not about a relationship anymore. It's about a, a set of rules again. We quickly go there. Now, um, Paul actually confronts a situation. How many of you know uh, Christians can be uh, hypocrites? <laughs> Real easy, right? Uh, it's nothing new. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul confronts Peter in his religious hypocrisy. Yep, in the Bible, there's a story where a Christian has to be rebuked, has to be corrected because he's being a hypocrite. It's uh, in Galatians 2, 14 through 16. And, and he's essentially, what's happened is Peter has a background in, in he was raised in, in the Jewish culture, which came along with the Jewish belief, right? So they were the chosen people. Uh, they were in God right from the beginning based on these rules. And, and so they had these set of rules that they would live out. And that revealed that they were, who they were, Jewish in nature, right? And so when they became Christians, they no longer needed to follow these rules for righteousness with God. But Peter was playing the fence. He would have friends that were Jewish and he'd have friends that were Gentiles and he would live like a Gentile when he was hanging out with them and he would live like a Jew when he was hanging out with these guys and then he would say, oh, you know what? We should be easier if we just all live like a Jew and, and I force these Gentiles to live this certain way and do these certain practices. Well, then they became, uh, it became works-based for their relationship no longer mattered. It was actually doing that mattered, right? And it says uh, here, if you who are a Jew live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like a Jew? If you, being religious, live unreligious life, not under the law, but not like under the law, how can you make other people that are not Jewish, not religious, live under religion or the law. We are Jews by birth, and not Gentile sinners. And yet, because we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but 
by faith in Jesus Christ, even we ourselves have believed in Christ Jesus. This is so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. Justified, I, I used to say it this way. It was like, for me to remember what it meant was just as if I didn't sin before God. Justified means that I was right before God. I, it looked at as just as if I didn't sin. Well, it wasn't any works that were going to do it. It was being in Christ. But what does that mean in Christ? Faith in Christ. I think we throw that around quite a bit um, and very, very loosely. Yeah, I, I believe. I believe. Well, so did the, in one scripture it says, so do the demons. The demons believe Jesus is who he says he is. But they're not going to be saved, right? There's a lot of people that will, in the last days, it says, uh, claim that Jesus, but we we claim that you are our Lord and, and, and we did many works in your name. And Jesus will literally say, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. He didn't look down on a roster and go, wait a second. Oh, yeah. There's those works that you did in my name. Ah, oh, you're in. No. I never knew you. So it's it's a relationship. It's some sort of relationship that we have with him that um, actually is what matters. Faith in him uh, requires us to trust, right? But let's see what we're trusting in. In Galatians 2, 19 through 21, it says, uh, basically, for through the law, I died to the law. In other words, I needed to die to these rules because they were of no effect. They were going to kill me anyhow, so that I might live for God. I have been, this is key, I have been crucified with Christ. Now, he's not literally been crucified, but he's making a statement here of faith. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Okay, that's interesting and unique, right? The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He made a statement there. I no longer live, okay, but he says, but Christ lives in me. Like he considered his old life crucified and dead. No longer alive. To that old Phil Santo. But instead, he's talking about something new that was in him. Not Phil Santo, but Christ who dwelt within me and lives within me, right? So, how does that play out? In Romans 12, it's really a, a good, well known verse for what that looks like. And we call it a living sacrifice. You know, many people, um, have said this, so I don't. I don't know where the quote came from, but a lot of a lot of people say, "Hey, it, it's easier to die for Christ than it is to live for Christ." In Romans twelve, it says, "Therefore, I urge you, brothers." It's Paul again saying, "That I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in in view of how good He is, how kind He is, His love for you, His payment on the cross for you, to offer your bodies." Not your spirit, but your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We often go to church and we think, you know, well, yeah, I sang and that was worship to God. He's saying actually giving him my body to do what he wants with it is actually worship. Do not be conformed by the pattern of this world, the things that we do around here in this world that we think are cool and, and trends and, and, and are in, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We, we kind of focus on the be transformed, and, and that rightly so. We want to be tra changed, right? Transformed into something else. But, but by the renewing, it's a renewing of our minds. There's a renewal process that needs to happen. We have these patterns in our life that have been 
grooves that we've we've worn in in the patterns of our own mind that tell us what we ought to do right um i've always done it this way therefore i do it this way uh, but instead he's saying there's a newness that needs to come about there's a new renewing of the mind that needs to come about that leads to transformed life proverbs 3 5 through 6 says uh, trust in the lord with all your heart so we're going to trust it with our heart. Don't lean on our understanding. Maybe you've heard this one. The patterns of our old past, right? But in all our ways, acknowledge him. In all of our ways. Where do I go today? What do I do today? Uh, who do I marry today? You know, maybe not today. Who do I marry? <laughs> uh, what car do I buy? He's actually, he cares about all those things. Acknowledge him in all your ways and what happens, and he will make straight your paths. How many paths are you on right now that are rocky, that are rough, man? He can make them straight. But it takes acknowledging him and giving him, Jesus, the rule and reign of our life. We become that living sacrifice. Galatians says it this way. Galatians 5, 16 through 26. It's essentially, the key here before I go into it is keep in step with the Spirit. Okay? Keep in step with the Spirit. We're going we're to see that. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the, de the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. Isn't that interesting? The things that I want to do are typically against God's will. Because I see and it looks appealing, right? But it's a different path that I need to be on. So he says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. There's that, that legal bound to do things right and and now he's saying you're not you don't you're not bound to that law that that list of rules that you need to keep but if you're led by the spirit now the works of the flesh are evident these are the things that we want to do we desire to do evil in our hearts right and it says this it says that it's sexual immorality impurity sensuality idolatry sorcery sorcery Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So, if there's anything I missed, or he missed, things like these covered, right? I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but... And, and here's where it's beautiful. I love a holy butt. This is a holy butt right here. But those who, uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. How many of us can use some self control? Against such, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. There it is again, putting to death my flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step by the Spirit, or with the Spirit, sorry. So what does it look like to not live a life of relation or uh, religion, or be a, a non-Christian that, that literally is just given over to these passions that we are bound under? We're both trying and striving to, to get through life and, and live a, a, a good life, right? Both of those groups. I once, honestly, I fit more of the religious, per well, beginning of my life, I fit the non-Christian without question. Uh, but then after that, for many years, I, I was more of the religious person. Someone who um, tried to to get along by the rules and, and made, you know, standards and held myself to them and other people to them. And, and then, you know, there came a point where I, that broke me as well. 
you know, I, I don't know if you know, but this world will break you. Well, so will religion. Um, so how do we become more in relationship? Well, we enter in through trusting that Jesus is who he is and said uh, that he did what he said he did. That he paid um, for, for my sin and raised from the dead so that I could have new life. That he gave me and imparted to me the Holy Spirit that dwells within me. Part of him that literally lives in me that helps me to be um, the person he desires. He's literally teaching me, renewing my mind and, and training me to be more like Christ. Now, I need to ask for the Holy Spirit to fill me and to lead me. I need to pray and, and seek forgiveness and repentance through Christ, but then ask for the Holy Spirit to fill me and lead me. That God were, would reveal his love to me um, daily through his word. I, you know, yeah, could you be a Christian um, without scripture? There are people in, in remote parts of the earth that literally don't have a Bible and yet they know Christ and they love Christ and, and that's great. But if you have access to the, the word of God, you're selling yourself short if you don't read it. Because it's not a, a list of rules and, and do's and don'ts. What it is, is a love letter to his children. And so it's a love letter that we then can grow daily in understanding how much he loves us. And in response, we then, uh, our desires change. So get into his word. Come through Christ in, in faith. Ask for the Holy Spirit. And then, honestly, for me, day to day, what does that look like? On my ride to work, I pray with my wife that, we would be filled with the Holy Spirit and that we, we, we would be spirit led throughout the day. And, uh, and I remind myself daily as well that what God did for me and, and during that time. And, uh, and then I pray that, you know, um, he would lead me in his word. And so then I spend some time after my drive, I spend some time in, in the word and, and ask him, where do you want to teach me, Holy Spirit? Often my thoughts, and then he'll lead me maybe to a, uh, a scripture or maybe to a set of scriptures or to a book to read uh, within uh, the Bible. And I find myself growing in love with him through that. And then I, I don't want to miss this, that um, asking for the leading of the Holy Spirit can mean moment to moment. Um, there are times where I start out well and in prayer and asking for the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then along the way, um, a conversation has happens or something like that, and, and I go south. And so uh, I, I like to think of it this way. The Bible says, uh, be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm a leaky vessel. <laughs> and, and I can let things in and I can let things out that maybe shouldn't be there. And so oftentimes I need to ask for the Holy Spirit to refill me. And, or for a question, a big question, like I'm buying a car. Lord, I really need you to offer my thoughts. And I will literally walk around looking at cars and praying, is this yours, the one that you picked for us? Is this the one you know is mechanically good and sound and gonna you know, be what we need? Is this, And literally I'm waiting, and, and this is probably the hardest part for most Christians, I'm waiting to hear back. Literally waiting upon him. That he says, my sheep hear my voice. He, we can hear him might come as a soft, still voice in, in your conscience, uh, uh, in your heart, or just a, a tug in a certain direction, but he will speak back. And, and that is a relationship that's required for us to be in Christ. Anyhow, that's our time uh, for today. Love you guys, and I hope that that uh, gave you an inkling into the goodness that God has for you, that he actually wants to spend time with you and be with you, not just give you a set of rules to live by, but he wants to be with you. All right, talk to you guys soon. Love you.